of Romans again, this time to chapter 9, where we will look today at the end of chapter 9 and the first 13 verses of chapter 10. So come with me to Romans 9, and we're going to read from verse 30 of chapter 9 until verse 13 of chapter 10. Great song, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, by Martin Luther, hero of the Reformation. Very appropriate that we sing that today as we consider Romans 9, and a topic that was near and dear to Luther's heart, because it was indeed the heart of the gospel, namely how men and women that are sinful can enter into a right relationship with God. How we answer that question really determines the state of our soul. So here now as we read from Romans 9, beginning at verse 30. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have obtained it, a righteousness that is by faith. But the people of Israel who pursued the law as the way of righteousness have not attained their goal. Why not? Because they pursued it not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. As it is written, see, I lay in Zion a stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. And the one who believes in him will never be put to shame. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify about them that they're zealous for God, but their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith, says, do not say into your heart, in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame, for there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. This is God's word. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, again, we thank you so much for the scriptures which are given to us as your people that we might read them and have eternal life. So bless that during the reading and the preaching of the word today, you will give life to your people. Fill me with the spirit to proclaim the word rightly. Grant all of us spiritual sense to hear and understand, to believe and to do what you command us and instruct us to do in your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. None of us like to be wrong, do we? There's one author who I enjoy reading, Don Carson, and he's made this point a few times. I've lost many debates in my life, but I've never lost a rerun. And if you think like that, you know what I'm saying? You maybe have a disagreement with someone and you go away and you start to reflect on what you said and what they said and and you start to think of all the things you said or what you really meant to say or what you said and how they should have understood what you said. And, And whether or not you won the argument or not in your mind, you were right, all right, and they were wrong. You might have lost the debate, but the rerun in your mind proved you to be the winner. That's because none of us like to be wrong. Now, on a little more serious note, none of us likes to see someone who's wrong declared right. I can still remember ninth grade biology class when our teacher paused class, turned on the TV, so we could watch the live reading of the verdict in the O.J. Simpson double murder trial. And I still remember the collective gasp in the classroom as he was pronounced not guilty. Guilty. 
And, and, and people were upset. And, and why were we upset? Here was someone who, from all appearances, in, in later history has made it even more clearly, he, he has all but said he did it without using those exact words. Here was someone who was in the wrong. And they were being declared not guilty. And that upsets us. And it should upset us. Both humans made in the image of God and God himself is grieved when there are failures of justice. When justice systems designed to protect the innocent and promote life fail for one reason or another. Well, I tell that story because I think when you come to Romans 9, especially verses 30 through 33, when these were first read, you might have gotten a collective gasp from the audience as well. Not because we're reading about the failure of a justice system, a little different plane here. We're reading instead about the display of God's grace. And in the display of God's grace, here's what happens. Some who are thought to be in the right are actually in the wrong. And those who are in the wrong are suddenly in the right. Listen to what Paul says here in verses 30 through 31 one more time. What then shall we say? That the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, have obtained it. A righteousness or a right standing with God that is by faith. But the people of Israel, who pursued the law as the way of righteousness, have not attained their goal. The Jews who are are in first place from a human standpoint when it came to entering a right relationship with God, those who followed the law, those who tried to obtain the righteousness that the law offers, they have failed to do so. Why? Because Paul says in verse 32, they pursued it not by faith, but as it were by works. They they thought they could reach that goal of righteousness through obeying the law, and they fell short. And that's a shock to Paul. It was a great surprise to Paul, so much so that he says back in chapter 9, verse 2, that he has great sorrow and unceasing anguish in his heart. And they could almost wish that he were cursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of his people. He's not shocked and surprised they couldn't obtain righteousness by works. He's shocked and surprised that they haven't seen the gospel and believed in Christ for salvation. His people thought they were in the right and they were really in the wrong. And at the very same time then, those who were always in the wrong are suddenly in the right. Again, verse 30, the Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness, have obtained it. A righteousness that is by faith. Here are these outsiders, Gentiles, dogs from a Jewish point of view, strangers to all that God is doing, people who aren't even trying to be right with God in the way that the law declares. Suddenly, they've they've obtained what Israel missed. This right standing with God by faith gospel has come to them and they believed it, whereas the gospel has come to the Israel and they have not. And what I want to look at today then is that contrast between Israel and Gentiles, between the reason that one has obtained salvation and the other has not. Ultimately, a contrast between faith alone as the way of being right with God and works or faith plus Works. That, that's what Paul chases in this passage. He answers this question, how do we become right with God? We'll answer it from three viewpoints. First, Paul addresses this issue of why we need to be right with God. If we're talking about entering into a right relationship with God, it kind of assumes, does it not, that we're in a wrong relationship with God. And Paul hints at that or declares that really in verses 1 through 4 of chapter 10. Look again at verse 1. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. He's already stated that that they've missed out on this right standing with God, and because of that, they need to be saved. In other words, they're in a dangerous situation, and they need to be rescued out of that situation. 
and he's praying for them. Why? Because they can't rescue themselves. They need God to enter into their situation and remove them from the danger that they are facing. Well, why do they need to be saved? Paul answers that in verses 2 and 3. First, verse 2, I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. But their zeal is not based on knowledge. They're working very hard, but they never obtain their goal. Why? Because they're seeking it in the wrong way. That they're plowing after this goal, but but they're not taking the right path to get to it. They're zealous, but they're zealous not with knowledge. And and on one hand, the, the zeal is commendable. That's a very Old Testament concept. Phineas is commended for his zeal when he slays an immoral and blasphemous Israelite man in Midianite woman in Numbers 25.11. When Elijah flees from Jezebel, he proclaims to the Lord, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, torn down your altars, put your prophets to death with the sword, and I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me Two, Elijah, Phineas, what were they concerned with? The way God's law was being trampled. The way it was being forsaken by spiritual adultery. And so they were zealous for the one true and living God. They wanted to call Israel back to faith and obedience to their covenant God. And and you would think that Paul would say, okay, zeal is good. You're imitating the Old Testament characters, but in their zeal, they're missing something. What is that something? Look at verse 3. Since they did not know the righteousness of God and sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. Israel has failed to take account of their sin. And the fact that their sin is so great that it separates them from God, that no human act, no human act of obedience, no human act of doing right, can ever bridge the gap between them and God. This righteous standard of God is so great and so high that all of our good works always fall infinitely short. Notice again, look a little closer at verse 3. Paul states they did not know the righteousness of God. In other words, they're ignoring God's way of bringing people into a right relationship with himself they're ignoring how god does this work of salvation instead they're trying to establish their own righteousness they're working very hard to make themselves right in the sight of god and because they're so busy doing that they ignore god's way they they ignore his way they try to do it themselves and thus they never submit themselves to god's way of bringing people into a right relationship with himself. They tr- keep trying to be good on their own terms. And even though they're, they're good and zealous, they've missed what all those Old Testament characters knew, that God's one way of bringing people into a right relationship with himself is faith alone. That is how God saved Abraham. And that example was to echo in the, in the mind of every Old Testament character that they would know they enter into a right relationship with God by faith Alone, And you know, this is something that Paul was familiar with, was it not? Once, he had been just like that. He's so burdened for his fellow Jews because he knows what they're wrestling with. He boasts in Philippians that he once had great confidence in his own efforts to keep the law. He was circumcised on the eighth day from the tribe of Benjamin. He kept the law like a Pharisee. He had a zeal for God, so much so that he persecuted the church. In his own eyes, he was blameless with reference to the law. There was this pride that he thought in his upbringing and his obedience, he had a head start on others. He was better than others, and he was accepted in the sight of God. But one day, God mercifully opened his eyes. And on the Damascus road, he realized that that all those works, all that heritage, all that standing meant nothing before the righteous standard of God, that righteousness comes by faith alone. And and, and it's good for us as the church just to take a moment today just just to check ourselves, just to look, look at our souls and make sure it's not the same way with us. That, that in our zeal for God, 
We're not making the mistake of trying to be right with God by our own efforts. Do we mistakenly think sometimes that being good, that going to church is the way to be right with God? That something we do would, would make us better than others and give us an advantage in the sight of God. You know, it doesn't have to be church. It doesn't have to just be in our culture or, or in the South. There are people who, because of their work in society or because of their political views or just a general sense of superiority, think that they are better than others. I think I've mentioned this before, but I'll say it again. When Tim Keller went to New York City to plant a church, he didn't come and start speaking to New Yorkers as if they were all prodigals who had wandered far from God. He spoke to them like they were legalists. And you think, well, New Yorkers aren't legalists. They're irreligious and they're liberal. And they're... He addressed them like legalists because there's something they do, whether it's a religious thing or just a secular thing, there's something they were doing that gave them a sense of superiority over others. And he's making the case there's nothing you do, political, religious, That makes you better than other people. The only thing you can do to be right with God and gain any standing with him is grace alone and faith alone in Christ alone. And that's the message for us from Romans, that we look to God alone and by faith alone for our right standing with him. Here's the other thing that we should consider before we leave this first point. There is another extreme whereby there are those who think that they try so hard to be right with God, but then there's others who think there's no hope they'll ever be right with God. They know their sin, and they know their lack of righteousness, and they feel that there is no hope for them. And so in the same way as the legalists, they're so self-focused that they never look to God for his mercy. What did Paul say in verse 30? The Gentiles who didn't pursue righteousness have obtained it. Those who didn't even try to be right with God have entered in to a right relationship with God. Why? Because Jesus died to pay for those sins. He lived to give them the obedience that they could never obtain by themselves. And when that good news came to them, as it should when it comes to us, they embraced it and God saved them and brought them into a right relationship with himself. That is the message of the gospel, a rebuke to the proud and good news to those who are low, that faith alone is our salvation. Let's look at verses four through eight now, because when Paul comes here, he's going to contrast different ways to be right with God. He's laid it out that the Jews are seeking one way and the Gentiles are seeking another, but now he's going to contrast the nature of of those two ways. He's going to answer the question that's, going to be in, that's been implied all along. In other words, why should we seek righteousness with God by faith alone? And here's the answer from verse 4. Because Christ ends using the law to obtain righteousness. Look closely at verse 4 for a moment. And I'm going to read from the ESV because I think it gets the nuance a little better in this verse. It reads, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The NIV reads culmination, and the word can go both ways, but I think in this context, end is the more accurate translation. Here's what Paul is saying. Christ ends using the law to establish your own righteousness. When you believe the gospel, that is the end of any efforts to use the law or obedience to make you right with God. Why do we believe in Christ? Because we realize we can't do anything on our own to make us right with God. We rest on Christ alone for our right standing with God. And thus, he is the end of using the law to obtain righteousness before God, that's Paul's thesis statement, so to speak. That's what, that's what he's laying out before them. But it's one thing to say it, and it's another thing to prove it. Well, you know what? Paul's going to prove it. And even more so, he's going to prove it from the Old Testament scriptures, showing that this has been God's way of saving people all along. The scriptures bear witness to both ways of righteousness, by your own works or by Christ. But whereas one is doomed to fail, the other leads to to eternal life. Look at that contrast just for a moment. First in verse 5, Paul cites Leviticus 18.5, and he says, Moses writes this about the righteousness 
that is by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. That's right out of the third book of the Bible, Leviticus, part of the Pentateuch, where God is addressing Israel as covenant people. He's bringing them in to the promised land. And on one level, this verse is just a reminder, I'm your God and you need to obey me as your covenant God. But you know what? If we probe deeper the message of the Old Testament, this verse has an even deeper meaning. Why? Because time and time again in the Old Testament, God was telling his people that if they want to live, they must perfectly obey him. Listen to just two verses. Deuteronomy 5.33. Walk in obedience to all that the Lord your God has commanded you so that you may live and prosper and prolong your days in the land that you will possess. Deuteronomy 5.29. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always so that it may go well with them and their children forever. What is What message is, is this verse emphasizing? That, that if you want to live, then you have to do what God commands. A reminder that we must obey, but, but as we really look at the ultimate meaning of that verse, highlighting the fact that life is tied to obedience. And if we disobey God, then we will die. A a reminder of the obligation on all of us that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden that we must obey God's commandments or we will experience death. The law tells us, I'll give you life if you obey me. But the problem is none of us on this side of the Garden of Eden can obey the law and live. So Paul gives the solution to the problem. In verses 6 through 8, He cites Deuteronomy 30, verses 12 through 14. Listen to this. But the righteousness that is by faith says, Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. Paul basically says, Don't try to do in order to be right. Rather, recognize God has already done all that must be done. You don't have to bring Christ down from heaven or up from the grave. He has done everything that must be done in order to save you. Now, only problem, you have to make a comment on this. The only problem is, of all the texts to cite, Paul really picked a difficult one. Because if you go back and read Deuteronomy 30, verses 12 through 14, it does not make any direct reference to Jesus Christ. In fact, it talks about Israel's ability to do the law. God has brought the law to them so that they can do it and obey it. And you're thinking, wait a minute, Paul just said we can't obey the law and earn a right standing with God. Why is he citing this text then to argue that we should believe in Jesus Christ. Here's the answer. Remember that Deuteronomy addresses the second generation of Israelites who are entering the promised land after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness. The previous generation broke God's covenant. Numbers 13, 14, they didn't believe in the Lord. They were faithless. And thus God committed them to wander in the wilderness and die. Now here's a new generation. And unlike the previous generation, the majority of these people believe in God. Moses is addressing them and saying that you must circumcise your hearts. You must have something take place on the inside of you so that you can be in a right relationship with God. And when we come to Deuteronomy 30, We read that God has done just that. In Deuteronomy 30, 14, he says, I've put the law in your mouth and I've put it in your heart. I've changed who you are on the inside. And because I've done that, God says, you can believe in me and obey me. There's an internal work that has preceded any attempt To obey. And you know what Paul is saying? That is what God does to us in the gospel. He brings it near. He calls us to obey it. 
He does something on the inside of us by His Spirit. And the response then is that we believe in Christ and we are declared righteous. And just like God brought the law to them and put it inside them, He has brought Christ to us that we might believe in Him and receive the righteousness of God. And Paul's point is that this is what the Old Testament has been telling you all along. You can strive after the goal of doing right, or you can look to God alone to do for you what must be done. One road is doomed to failure. The other leads to eternal life. And that's, again, the question to ask us. What are we trusting today? Thirdly and lastly, then, the right way to be right with God. Paul states it clearly in verse 9, that if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. What must a person do in order to be saved? They must trust Christ. They must confess him as Savior. They must acknowledge he is the Lord of all. And he died and arose again in order to accomplish my salvation. In other words, all of the hope and all of the trust for eternal life is located where? Not in what I do, but in Christ who died and rose again for me. And if you do that, if that is your trust, Paul says you are saved. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And that's how I conclude then. Just to consider that thought, young and old, New to this church or not? How is it with our soul today? Are we all right with God by faith in Christ? Because if you are, rejoice. Rejoice in your right standing with God. That God has not done a travesty of justice in saving you because Jesus lived for you and Jesus died for you. And all those benefits are credited to you. And if you're not a believer, if there's this element of self-trust, self-reliance, then lay it aside today and trust alone in Christ in his righteousness. He forgives. He receives. He gives us eternal life. Let's give thanks to God for his grace. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your mercy towards us. And I, I pray that this reminder of the gospel would, either, would awaken dead sinners, if there are any among us who don't know Christ, or that it would simply be an encouragement to us as your people to daily trust in your mercy, to just constantly come to you in in faith and reliance and and know your love for our souls and and live in the reality of that. That would be our daily trust. Lord, bring forth good fruit from this gospel seed, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's turn to hymn 556.